Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome uh, Dr. Hannes Fellner as our, I believe, the last uh, talk in the OFI lecture series of the season, but stay tuned for additional announcements for the fall. Hannes Fellner is an associate professor in the Department of Linguistics at the University of Vienna, uh, as well as the director of the Austrian Institute for Research on China and Southeast Asia and the board member of the Young Academy of the uh, Austrian Academy of Sciences, all very well deserved because he's done a very innovative work uh, on a variety of linguistic and historical aspects of the Silk Road trade route uh, and published prolifically in formal linguistics and historical linguistics, Indo-European reconstru language reconstruction and history proper making a uh, considerable use of digital tools uh, in doing so, and has in so doing become a leading figure in the emerging field of digital philology. I first got to know Hannes when he returned to Vienna after getting his PhD at Harvard University, which you might have heard of, in 2013. Uh, here he worked with Melanie Monson collecting uh, manuscripts of the Tocharian language, which you might not have heard of, although, all of us who are close to Hannes, uh, for us, it's the language. Uh, the, uh, he spent a year uh, at Leiden, at the University of Leiden, a center for linguistics, before receiving his own uh, START grant from the Austrian Science Fund uh, called uh, The Characters of the Silk Road, whose aim, as I understand it, is to apply uh, digital technology to the challenging task of documenting uh, and interpreting ancient linguistic evidence and piecing together the linguistic situation on the Silk Road um, a long time ago, about which Thomas will have more to tell us. Thanks very much. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, thank you for, for this kind and over generous <laughs> introduction. <laughs> um, yes, so uh, actually, for those. I mean, everyone here, actually, almost everyone I know. Uh, so um, welcome. Uh, for those of you out uh, in the World Wide Web who don't know me and maybe have not uh, read my abstract, um, I have to apology. I have to apologize because I will not talk about the um, black market, uh, cyber black market Silk Road, which I think is not longer function. So, um, uh, but I will. I will talk about the real. Uh, agency group. Um, so here's a little bit of, of background. Um, from around the second century C on uh, the communities along the trade routes of the ancient Silk Road in the Tarim Basin were centers of writing, copying, translating, and transmitting. Um, so here is one of those centers in the Tarim Basin, where's the Tarim Basin that's uh, today's northwestern China. Um, the, the Uyghur Autonomous Region uh, of, the, of the People's Republic. Um, here, uh, as you can see, is the Silk Road, um, basically stretching uh, here from, um, well, Eastern uh, China uh, to basically uh, the Mediterranean, and we are here. So here, this desert here is the Taklamakan Desert, to which we owe uh, the preservation of uh, the manuscripts I will talk about, um, and, and basically the, the um, Silk Road here splits in two sections, a northern one and a southern one. Um, here uh, on this side, um, uh, so on the north side, there's the Tianshan Mountains. On this side, basically, uh, there are the Kunlun Shan and, and the Tibetan Plateau. Uh, here's the Parmir uh, uh, region. Uh, so the, some of the highest mountains and deepest depressions are in this uh, area. Um, and because we have these high mountains um, on both uh, on the north uh, side here and the south side here, uh, we have very fertile um, uh, oases. And it was in these oases that kind of early urban culture uh, developed. So recent archaeological uh, findings um, uh, basically bring basically bring this um, urban, uh, uh, this urbanization back uh, uh, into the Bronze Age uh, even. And basically since the Bronze Age, we have kind of urban uh, centers uh, there. Um, as you can glean from this uh, map here, which is a, a map of today, um, uh, this region has always been 
politically uh, interesting uh, and contested. Yes. Uh, could you reshare the slides with your oh. window because the, they are not advancing in the screen? Okay. Stop and put the desk over here. Yes. And then I have to do this. And then I probably have to use slideshow. And then we're good. Yep. Yes, we are good. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, as you can see, so this uh, where are we? this little piece here uh, is the right. This little piece here is um, Afghanistan, uh, and then some other stands and contested areas of India, uh, and so on. And, and you have Kashmir here. So uh, and and of course you know uh, or probably have heard about things going on in Xinjiang. So kind of a political uh, active uh, scene and basically politically active for the last uh, 1,500 years. Um, okay, so uh, this is a nice uh, map that just shows you uh, the interesting things that were discovered uh, for a little bit more um, than 100 years uh, ago. So basically when, when uh, the last dynasty of China, the Qing uh, dynasty, was kind of in decline, uh, the imperial powers uh, back then. Um, so um, England, France, Germany, Russia, Japan, um, all um, started to do like semi-espionage, semi-archaeological expeditions uh, to these northwestern regions of, of uh, China back then, um, because basically nobody was kind of looking. And, and uh, there were rumors that there are interesting things there. So everyone went there. And uh, it, what, what was in turn uh, discovered changed whole fields um, forever, basically. And, and it will, I, I think, still take a couple of generations until we have the full grasp of what was discovered there. Um, so all the dots that you can see here are basically uh, archaeological sites, and some of them, like uh, Kucha and also Turfan, uh, today's Turpan, um, coincide with uh, actual settlements that have existed for uh, almost over uh, 2,000 uh, years. And all the nice colored squares are uh, different languages. And uh, in fact, we have uh, more than 20 languages uh, from these different spots uh, in more than 19 different writing systems um, and uh, coming from uh, six different language families. Uh, so we have Semitic languages there. We have, of course, European languages there, and I will talk um, a lot about them. We have uh, Sino-Tibetan, uh, Trans-Himalayan languages there. Uh, so everything <laughs> is almost everything uh, is there, as you can see here in German. But uh, anyway, so um, uh, besides the ones that I will talk about, we have we have of course very old uh, Chinese fragments from there. We have uh, Tibetan fragments from there, uh, modern Persian, Middle Persian, Hebrew, Syriac. Uh, Greek uh, and so on. So it's it's uh, the whole area is, is a treasure trove of uh, interesting things. And and uh, as a, as a side note, uh, um, weird quote unquote weird things like we have uh, translations of Aristotle into Syriac uh, that were found uh, there. Uh, things things like that. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, kind of my stuff uh, from from there uh, genre wise. Um, Okay, so uh, here we have uh, Fashian, and Fashian was a, a Chinese monk who traveled uh, these uh, areas, and he kind of gives us an eyewitness account. Um, and here's what he says. So all the king kingdoms there um, only had their own peculiar barbarous speech. Uh, so basically every oasis had its own um, kind of city-state, and they all had their own barbarous speech. Uh, the monks, however, who had given up uh, worldly life and quitted their families, were all students of Indian books and Indian language. Uh, and that's quite interesting, uh, of course. Um, so what are the languages uh, here that were heavily influenced by this Indian uh, uh, culture? Um, Buddhist Sanskrit, so a version of Sanskrit heavily uh, influenced. Um, by Indian, uh, so at that time, Middle Indic uh, vernaculars of different uh, provenances. Uh, we have Tukharian, and we'll talk a bit more about that, of course. 
uh, and we have Saka, uh, a Middle Eastern uh, Iranian branch, uh, which actually comes in two languages from uh, that area. Uh, this uh, picture here is also uh, interesting. It's from the uh, Hermitage in St. Petersburg, and it displays the royal family of Kutcher. Uh, so 90% sure that they were that at least one of the languages that they spoke was to carry. Um, uh, and, and it's from the fifth, uh, sorry, sixth, uh, seventh uh, century, um, our, our time. Um, but very likely these, these are kind of the first pictures of, of to carry it. <laughs> um, and uh, so these three Indo-European languages were um, the major players in these eastern parts of the Silk, Silk Road during the first uh, millennium. And this is the same map uh, as we saw before, but only zooming in uh, on, on these languages, uh, because first, they are interesting in European varieties. Second, they're all written in the same script, about uh, which we will talk about. Uh, and uh, third, um, uh, most of the other languages basically were stored there in libraries and not used there, but these uh, were actually used uh, there. I mean, uh, Buddhist Sanskrit is kind of a um, erudite uh, lingua franca, uh, and uh, Saka and Tukherin as spoken languages. We we know that also because we have precious little things like um, a travel dictionary, Cotonese, Chinese, um, and and things like that, which I think must be one of the oldest uh, travel dictionaries with with funny phrases like "bring me wine." How much is this silk bolt? Um, I have to go to the bathroom and stuff. But, um, um, I mean, most most of you here uh, uh, know this, and I'm sure most of you uh, out there know this too. But but these are our European languages, basically on the old in the old world. Uh, so without the colonial uh, expansion of of the Romans uh, uh, and uh, uh, Romans languages and English, basically. Um, and we have uh, 12 branches, and what's interesting, there are only two branches that don't have living descendants, and uh, on the one hand, this is Anatolian, which was spoken uh, in today's uh, Turkey, uh, and the other one is Tukharian, which was spoken in, in Xinjiang, uh, about which we already uh, talked about. Uh, and of course, all of you know, but uh, English and German, of course, also belong uh, to, to this branch. And uh, just to give you a proof of that, uh, I've uh, given you here uh, to Karen A and to Karen B. Uh, Cotonese, it's one branch and the major and most important branch of Saka. Then uh, English in the middle, and then uh, our classical in European languages, uh, Sanskrit, Greek, uh, and Latin. And then uh, on the very right, um, the in European reconstruction. We don't have to bother uh, about this, but just for information's sake, let me just take a, a couple of examples uh, and, and pronounce them actually. So Peter was kindly asking me whether I have uh, audio files. <laughs> uh, I don't, but I will try my best to, uh, to bring out my best to carry an AB and Cotonese speaker here. Um, so let's take uh, the word for 100. We have to carry an A kunt, uh, to carry an B kante, uh, Cotonese uh, sata. Uh, then, of course, Sanskrit Shatam, uh, Greek Hecaton, uh, Latin Kentum. Uh, let's take one more. Let's take new because it's nice to carry an A new, uh, to carry an B new, uh, Kotanese uh, Naucha, uh, Sanskrit Nawa, uh, Greek Neos, uh, Latin Novos, uh, and so on. So you see, uh, Indo European languages are fairly closely related. To carry an A and B are fairly closely uh, uh, related. Um, and this is just to give you an impression where we are uh, language-wise. Uh, we're still continuing uh, the background here. So despite the linguistic importance as a principal new branch uh, discovered a bit more than 100 years ago of Indo-European, that's Tocharian, despite the linguistic imp uh, importance as major branch of uh, East Middle Iranic, Saka, despite the linguistic importance uh, as interesting version of Indic influenced by vernaculars, uh, Buddhist Sanskrit, and despite the historic importance as primary witnesses of the heyday of the Silk Road, that's true for Sanskrit, uh, Tocharian, and Saka, um, despite the historic importance as first attested non Indic Buddhist tradition, um, that's true for Tocharian and for Saka, 
one could argue about Chinese, but um, Chinese, of course, the tradition is, is also old uh, and starts around the first century. But in terms of extant uh, manuscripts, basically to Karen and Saka uh, first. Um, uh, and despite the historic importance as vehicles of Indian uh, erudition and religion towards China, that's also true for Sanskrit to Karen and Saka, this language, especially to Karen and Saka, are insufficiently uh, investigated, unfortunately. Um, the main reasons for their uh, uh, status as under researched languages are uh, they uh, were discovered fairly late uh, in the game. So, of course, Sanskrit is an almost, almost, I mean, not in the West, but in the West, there's a, a 300, almost 300 year tradition of investigating uh, Sanskrit. And of course, um, um, there's an even older for, for Greek and Latin, but uh, of course, Saka and Tukherin were discovered late in the game. Um, there's, there's super fragmentary uh, attestation. That's true for all of them. Uh, but especially, uh, especially for Tukharin. Uh, so basically, for Tukharin and Saka, we don't have a complete, any complete uh, uh, text or, or complete manuscript. Um, we have one bigger thing for for Kotanis, but basically everything is super, super fragmented, as we will see. And uh, until the twenty first century, the access to text was guarded uh, only by a few specialists. Um, so. It's one of them. Um, uh, so this basically contributed to uh, their status as being uh, fairly uh, under-researched. Uh, let's look at, at the corpus. Um, so here uh, we have a very nice uh, manuscript. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, kind of codicology, but just uh, take this one leaf. So that's basically a front side and a back side uh, of one complete leaf out of a book. And we will look at how these books uh, looked like. Um, and terminology-wise, we would call this a fragment. And that's a complete fragment. Why, why, it is, why uh, it's a fragment? Because uh, it's basically only a part of the book and we don't have the book. But that's nice. So basically nothing, nothing is gone. Everything's there. Uh, all the characters that we want uh, are there. This is the Schnuller. We'll talk about that. Um, so all, all's fine. That's a fragment. Uh, this is also a fragment. <laughs> so, um, and then we can ask: so, what what is the what is the ratio uh, between uh, these kind of fragments uh, and these kind of fragments? And for this, uh, we want to look at uh, Tocharian, uh because Tocharian, uh is best um, now best investigated from from kind of a, a data point of view and from a digital point of view. Um, so for, for Tukarian A, we have around 60,000 word uh, tokens, and for Tukarian B, we have around uh, 156,000, uh, 157,000 word uh, tokens. Um, and so a total of, of 200,000 words, um, which I think, so uh, the Tukarian B count is approximately uh, approximately, uh, I think, Gothic, maybe maybe even a bit more than, than Gothic. So comparatively normal sized in European, old in European language. Um, oh, here's the comparison. And uh, uh, the, the both numeric epics, if you take them together, Iliad and Odyssey have 200 uh, uh, in total. So that's basically all, all of Tocharian can be compared to, to the numeric epics in terms of word tokens. Um, and now uh, let's look at, at kind of the word count uh, uh, and uh, the um, kind of fragment count. Um, so uh, we have around 9,000 fragments that have between zero and 50 words. And if we go to the other end, uh, we have uh, only 42 that have uh, uh, between 200 and 250 words. So that shows you the fragmentation, uh, the scale of fragmentation uh, of, of Tocharian. And uh, similar things are true for, for Buddhist Sanskrit and for uh, Kotanis uh, as well. Um, OK, so some characteristics of the manuscripts that are pronounced. So they're written in, in ink. 
um, and stylus on locally produced paper. Also, ink and stylus are locally produced, but the model for ink, stylus, and paper uh, was actually Chinese. But so they picked it up and then did it by themselves. Uh, so a new new research in Paris uh, by uh, my friend and colleague Georges um, um basically shows that most of the of the manuscripts were uh, produced locally uh, in in the Tarim Basin, but in in a manner um, of uh, kind of Chinese uh, paper. Um, the most of the manuscripts uh, belong to to the so-called Pustaka or Poti uh, format. Uh, and this is this uh, uh, that we know that basically spread uh, from from uh, India uh, um, well, to Central Asia and to Southeast Asia. And basically things are uh, written back and forth and, and then they're basically stapled uh, on top of each other. And um, usually there's space around the so-called Schnurloch, the string hole, uh, and then they're, um, they're, they're punched through and then bound together. Uh, usually with um, back and forth, they have um, uh, wooden uh, plates um, uh, where very often we find kind of um, uh, artistic uh, things on them, like like uh, illuminated uh, manuscripts, but only on the, on the uh, on the wooden uh, frames, and and uh, sometimes there are color phones uh, on them. Uh, but uh, the problem, at least for Tukarian and Koten, is that there are almost no extant uh, color phones. Um, uh, yeah, dateable, um, uh, these things, so our manuscripts are basically only, or manuscript fragments, uh, uh, to be precise, are only uh, approximately dateable uh, by uh, precious few data documents, which I can tell you are for Tokarian three and maybe uh, 12 for Cotonies. Um, uh, there are some precious few C14 uh, dates that have been taken uh, for, for I think, uh, 12 different uh, manuscripts uh, for in, in Tukarian, uh, and none so far, as far as I know, for uh, uh, Kotanese and some uh, for, for the Sanskrit. But, I mean, C14 uh, gives you a broad range, and then we also don't know um, if it gives us anything really concrete within this range because uh, the, the material is composite and we know that paper was recycled for, for generations actually. So um, this is all uh, uh, And then of course we can do uh, some conjectures uh, based on, on literature and archeological findings. The most important for this are, are um, coinage. Uh, there is some uh, coinage um, in, in found in the Tarim Basin. And um, we have uh, Chinese, which are more reliable, and Greek, which are less reliable sources where we can approximate if some king is mentioned somewhere. Um, so this is, these are basically our, our dating, um, our, our kind of uh, very approximate dating tools that we have, uh, but uh, the most important for, for kind of a relative chronology um, is uh, paleography. Um, about which I will talk a lot uh, soon. Um, just a, a, sh a brief overview over uh, what we what we have in terms of text and genres. So um, mainly that's true for Sanskrit, Saka, and Tukarian. We have uh, Buddhist uh, literature. What's interesting, especially in Tukarian, um, the, the, these are not one-to-one -one, uh, translations from Indian sources, um, but kind of uh, rephrasing uh, and and a lot of commenting on uh, original sources. Um, also interesting from a Buddhological point of view is um, that there is a lot of original but non-canonical uh, Buddhist literature. Non-canonical means that it doesn't belong to the three uh, main uh, genres that we have in in uh, kind of Buddhist traditions that have canonical texts. Uh, so uh, Vinaya texts, so order rules. Uh, so rules of, of Buddhist monasteries, um, uh, sutras, uh, and um, uh, Abhidharma, so uh, kind of kind of philosophical uh, text about uh, doctrine. Um, and uh, in Tukaran, we find a lot of non-canonical stuff like uh, Buddhist plays that also exist in Sanskrit, but uh, they, they kind of made their own uh, interesting uh, Buddhist uh, plays. Um, then we have a bit of literature connected to Indian uh, erudition and not 
specifically Buddhist or not only Buddhist. So we have medical texts that, that kind of are uh, related to uh, Ayurveda uh, kind of uh, Sanskrit texts. Uh, we have astrology, we have grammatical treaties, um, all, everything fragmentary, but interesting things like we have fragments of, uh, of Katantra, one of the main commentators of Panini. We have precious two fragments um, in Sanskrit of Panini, which is all those Panini fragments that we have. The next ones that we have are a thousand years later. Um, we have one which seems to be, uh, we have one to carry in basically um, paradigm um, where, uh, where basically Indian and, and Tocharian are fleshed out on, on a little fragment, which seems to be kind of the um, a sutra of Panini translated into a paradigm, uh, which is also quite cool, but only a few, uh, a very few of these uh, things. And then we have a, a wee bit of uh, secular uh, literature, so some administrative documents and graffiti and, and inscriptions. Okay, now let's talk about the script. Um, that's partially why I'm here. Um, uh, so Sanskrit to Karen Saka were written in a special Central Asian uh, variety of the Indian Brahmi script. So we call it uh, Tarim Brahmi. Um, there's some evidence that it was also used on a much uh, um, much smaller scale for, uh, for some Iranic uh, languages and Old Turkic. And uh, basically we have documents um, from uh, um, the fourth, so that's for Tocharian um, and uh, Kota and, and Saka from the fourth uh, century until around the 13th uh, century. So one very late um, uh, Tocharian copy of a manuscript uh, is was C14 dated around the 13th uh, century. Um, so here's just, just to, to give you a uh, just some examples here is a, a Sanskrit uh, sutra. A, um, I forgot what it was, a Tocharian, um, I think that's a medical document. And uh, again, another sutra here in Kotanese. If you, if you look closely, or maybe you can just feel that these, uh, that these different uh, styles of writing are basically related and come from one. Uh, source. Um, so I have to talk a little bit about what kind of um, writing system this was. So it's basically an, an uh, Abu Gida or alpha syllabary where the smallest segment uh, is a combination of consonant uh, and vowel. Um, and every segment comes with an inherent A. Of course, I mean, it was kind of adapted for, for Sanskrit where the predominant vowel uh, by far is A. Ah. Um, and uh, if you want to have another um, uh, vowel, you, you basically add uh, diacritics. And here, this is just a, a Devanagari uh, uh, example. So basically, I, I kind of wrote these little uh, vowels up here because they're kind of diacritically uh, marked. Uh, I should have not done this for this one, but it doesn't matter. Um, so uh, it, just to give you an impression, uh, um, so the, the usual, uh, the usual, um, uh, the usual uh, character is CV, but of course, if a word starts with a vowel, then you get a distinct uh, vowel uh, um, characters and, and we call them aksharas uh, from the Indian tradition and the akshara in the Indian tradition is basically um, the, the yeah, the atomic, because Akshara means indestructible, the atomic part uh, um, of speech and uh, later than uh, writing. Uh, but just uh, to show you the, the difference between an Abu Gida and the normal uh, syllable uh, script here, um, you have a uh, um, nice Tukharian, Brahmi, uh, and this is Ka, this is Ki, um, this is Ku with the U, this is Ke with the E, this is Ko. And if you compare it to a real uh, syllabary uh, like hiragana in Japanese, uh, um, so basically these are completely different uh, characters. Well, basically here the main character shape stays intact and only gets um, um, altered. Well, itself does not get altered, but basically you can alter the inherent vowel R by applying this uh, diacritics. No diacritic here because the R is inherent. 
Um, yeah, this is this great uh, alphabet family tree. Um, I think it changed one arrow, but I forgot where. Uh, anyway, <laughs> we are talking about uh, this family of scripts. Uh, so uh, Brahmi uh, has given rise to a lot of scripts that are in use, uh, still in use in South and Southeast Asia. Um, and um, the kind of immediate, more or less immediate ancestor of our Tarim Brahmi is uh, the Gupta uh, script. Um, so here you see the, uh, the, the Gupta script. Um, and uh, up there, this is the old Brahmi, basically kind of a, a compromise of all things that have been written on uh, inscriptions, uh, basically by uh, Ashoka. Um, okay. Um, so uh, here we have a, a stemma where we can kind of see the relatedness uh, and, and kind of approximate uh, dates of everything. So uh, a Northwestern Gupta variety, uh, which one I think we still have to figure out by comparing what we have in manuscripts and what we have um, in, uh, in, in inscriptions, um, came uh, to the Tarim Basin and uh, basically with palm leaves imported from India. So Sanskrit texts written on palm leaves from India, uh, which are the oldest palm leaves extant uh, that we have, came to the Tarim Basin and were read and uh, spoken. And at some point they started, because they didn't have palm leaves in this, <laughs> in this dry, uh, dry climate, uh, they started their paper production and copied, started to copy these texts. And as soon as they started to copy this text, we speak about Parim uh, Gupta because uh, kind of a, a native Parim uh, uh, tradition of writing Brahmi uh, started. And um, it seems that uh, that kind of at the same time, at least calligraphically, a Sanskrit was uh, uh, written down on paper uh, in the fourth century also Tokarian was. And there's new research that also suggests that Kotanese actually was also part of the game, so starting in the fourth uh, century. Of course, the, the Sanskrit palm leaves uh, that we have and some of the uh, Sanskrit wooden documents that we have from this era, uh, they're, uh, they're a little bit older, uh, of course, and partially have an even older uh, uh, script there. But basically here, uh, our, our native tradition uh, starts and then uh, Sanskrit basically continues everywhere and in each uh, kind of um, um, descendant of Tarim Gupta. And then we have kind of a divide between North uh, and South. And there's a lot of variation uh, uh, in, in the South. And there's also a lot of variation in the North. But these are kind of the broad strokes that uh, Lore Sander uh, in her dissertation in, in the 19, uh, late 1960s uh, uh, figured out. And, and basically, we are uh, all kind of standing on, on this, on the shoulders of this uh, giantess uh, in the field. Um, is luckily still uh, alive and, and kicking. Um, here, uh, so in Sander basically came up with this terminology that's here in brackets. I use or we use in my team this kind of new terminology because ethnolinguistically, uh, Turkestan uh, is not the best term because Turkestan is everything outside of, of Beijing to basically Vienna. Uh, I mean, if you if you really if you really take it seriously. So we kind of uh, uh, basically wanted to give it a neutral uh, ge geographical term. So we, we kind of stick to uh, uh, Tarim. Um, and here are the Shibulevs, so they're kind of uh, distinguishing uh, characters um, or some of the characters that can show you the, distinct, the distinguishing uh, features uh, between, uh, well, different layers and different uh, geographical uh, uh, regions. Um, so just just one broad thing that you might see is that uh, the, the further down in time or, or up, it depends how you look, but uh, the later you get uh, uh, the, the rounder or the closed, uh, the more closed uh, the, some of the forms get. So if you look at R, and I'm mentioning this because we'll talk about it. Uh, so R here has an open top, the, the independent R, uh, quite open top, quite open top, closed top, closed top. Top. Um, and, and if you look at L, uh, for example, uh, uh, you have kind of the same uh, development uh, here uh, and also the Ma. Uh, so that
that, that's one kind of uh, tendency that things, the later you get, things get a little bit more closed um, and, and rounded. Um, okay. And uh, this is just uh, the geographical uh, distribution. Um, and one thing that we still have to figure out is uh, where did everything start and how did it spread through uh, all of the Tarim Basin? Um, and um, yeah, there are, there are different theories. And today, uh, with one of my case studies, I will try to hint at a possible solution. Okay, so here's uh, the, the project. Uh, some of the problems I mentioned, but let me uh, sum them up. Um, so the exact provenance and dating of many manuscripts or manuscript fragments is unknown. Countless manuscripts um, fragments have not been identified regarding the content and literary genre. Uh, several thousand, as you saw, uh, of smaller fragments remain scattered and could not be joined uh, to other manuscripts so far. Most of the manuscripts are damaged with considerable gaps and broken off script. And except uh, for the Tukarian corpus in the comprehensive edition of Tukarian manuscript, uh, none of the other corpora um, uh, available online are searchable or were searchable in any, any meaningful way. Um, and most of uh, the other languages online corpora, if they exist, um, uh, do not conform to, to digital standards. Uh, so this is basically with what we had to start five years ago. Um, so, and uh, what what was our original goal? And then I can tell you what we what we achieved so far and what we hope to achieve in the last year. Uh, so the goal of the project is the classical paleographical uh, questions, namely uh, which text was written by whom, when, where, and how, uh, maybe also why, in order to trace the evolution of the scripts in, in real terms. Um, um, Laura Sander in, in the late 60s only had specimens and not the whole uh, thing uh, in front of her. Um, even though I'm, I'm pretty sure that most of what she said will remain true, but now we can basically do it on, on the whole corpus and uh, also uh, quantitatively. Uh, want to reveal the relationship between script types, languages, and also genres, because we see that genres are written. So basically, it depends which genre you have. Uh, you get different uh, kind of styles of script, which, which is interesting, but not too weird. I mean, we, in our kind of Roman alphabet tradition, have similar, uh, similar things. Um, we want to try to categorize countless um, text fragments that are so far unidentified. So for example, the whole collection for Tokarian manuscripts in London, uh, we don't know where it, where it came from. So for, for the, the Germans took records, the Russians took records, basically where they excavated or bought it. Um, but uh, for, for uh, the, the British collection of, of Tokarian manuscripts uh, and for part of the Cotonese manuscripts, we, we just don't know that, but it will be interesting. I mean, for, for linguistic reasons, uh, but also mutatis mutandis for historical reasons. Um, this is something that we hoped uh, to do. We'll see whether we will be able to do it. But basically, based on paleography, recombine uh, scattered fragments just to create a bit more of linguistic uh, context. So I'm a linguist by education, profession, and passion. Uh, so uh, the, the one idea of having this project was just to have more complete sentences of Tocharian that we can judge morphologically and syntactically. Um, and of course, I mean, that's kind of the bigger uh, question with which you have to sell uh, bigger grants uh, to better understand uh, literacy and writing culture in the Tarim Basin. So there are models where uh, once we figure out or once we know kind of for a specific region, the number of different hands and maybe different writing schools, the models that you can basically plug in that tells you, okay, how many people were probably literate um, if we have the ratio of people who wrote and the ratio of people who lived there. And we know quite well how many people lived there because the Chinese um, overlords uh, in these areas made very uh, accurate counts of, of households uh, and people. Um, Yes, and then, uh, of course, uh, we want to make all this available um, to other people uh, uh, in order uh, uh, for them to use them in, in historical research or uh, urological uh, research or any or any anything else. Um, 
So our information is distributed across, and now we come to, to the digital part, uh, is distributed across uh, two components. We have a text database, um, which has Sanskrit, Tukarian, and Saka. The most complete now is uh, Tukarian, followed by Saka, followed by Sanskrit. Uh, same is true for, for the dictionaries. Um, each component is an encoded in XML. Um, and all data, once we will be finished, will be available to the public, both uh, in kind of raw data and through a web app that I hope I will be able to show you um, today. Um, we want to enable data queries based on philological, linguistic, paleographic uh, criteria encoded in the database. Uh, as well, of course, as combinations of uh, these broad uh, areas. Um, and we want to allow users to view individual records in a maximal, maximally flexible way in order to accommodate a wide variety of uh, research questions. Um, so let's look uh, at this uh, uh, THT273. Uh, so that's just a cyclum. Uh, you, you don't have to remember that. But uh, basically, we are here. Uh, this is the line we, we want to look at, uh, just to exemplify uh, what we do uh, digitally. Um, so here is the transcription of this line. Um, this now is not uh, super, super human readable, but is as human readable as it gets. Um, and uh, so we have this uh, little uh, half sentence here in such a and uh, 25 is, is um, basically uh, marks uh, the, the 25th uh, stanza of uh, a metrical text um, because we can here encode uh, everything that's interesting. So the, the lexical information that basically links back to the dictionary parts, uh, metrical constituency, um, um, because this is also another thing to carry in uh, speakers uh, or poets were extremely eager in exploiting uh, Sanskrit uh, uh, meters. So one of my colleagues, uh, Dieter Gunkel, uh, he figured out that basically there are meters attested in Tukharin, even though the, the metrical uh, scheme is a little bit different, so the uh, Tukharin does not have long and short vowels. But in terms of syllable count, uh, Tocharian uses meters that only exist in kind of fancy Indian high-tech metrical literature and nowhere else. So basically you don't find them in Sanskrit literature, but you find them in, in kind of scientific metro, metrology. No, that's wrong. Anyway, but you find them in, in Indian uh, erudite me metrical text, but also then in literature in Tocharian, which is weird, but interesting. Uh, and then uh, kind of philological things um, we can annotate like, uh, so we know uh, uh, by comparison that we have to supply Kushvi here because this is the genitive here of, of the word for teacher, uh, Kushinze, and then uh, uh, kind of things like uh, 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 if we supply something or uh, other kind of philological uh, things we can uh, also annotate uh, in this way. Um, here, don't look too closely, but basically this table gives you an overview over some of the morphological and phonological changes uh, that happen in the course of Tukarian B. I, I want to focus on Tukarian B because Tukarian B um, and Kotanis have uh, kind of a long, uh, over hundreds and hundreds of years attested history uh, and similar to German or English. Uh, so we have Old English, Middle English, uh, Modern English, we have Old High German, Middle uh, High German, uh, Modern High German, and similar, uh, we call it differently, but we have kind of a similar development for uh, to carry B. And here are some of the changes. Uh, the thing is we can encode uh, these changes. Uh, in We do this in the dictionary. So here is our, our transcription, and here is the accompanying uh, dictionary entry of uh, Kashinze. And then uh, my, my dear colleague and friend Bernhard Koller um, found ways to uh, basically uh, non really human readable encode uh, certain uh, phonological uh, features uh, so that we can mark off a variant. So if we see Krishinze, uh, um, um, we, we know uh, that something, something happened there uh, as compared to kind of the classical standard uh, uh, to carry in B. Um, and, and with this, we can basically highlight in the text uh, different 
uh, on different strata uh, of, of morphological and phonological uh, change. Um, like this. So um, this 273 again, and uh, here we can highlight in this text, so which forms are phonologically or morphologically archaic. So you can see, um, well, for this is hard because either this is not encoded or uh, uh, not relevant for one of these. Uh, and let's just focus on archaic. So we have 28 archaic forms. Uh, that's the majority of forms in this uh, text. So very likely linguistically, this guy is an archaic uh, text. Um, what we also do uh, is um, we use transcribos. So basically here you can see this, um, these points here, um, and these contain the coordinates of the aksharas of the uh, uh, characters on the photographs, so on the facsimiles. Uh, so we put them uh, in, into transcribos. Um, and I'm here at the OFI, so I have to just briefly say that the uh, machine learning algorithm they use for recognizing um, scripts, uh, handwritten or printed, does not quite work for us because it's too fragmentary and there's too much variation, unfortunately. But maybe soon uh, with the development of AI going on right now and an update of transcribers coming in June. So maybe we get a little bit better results, but basically a lot of this really has to be done uh, uh, by hand. And we have uh, had uh, and have a lot of uh, student uh, research assistants who, who helped us uh, in this task. Um, so these points are the coordinates on the facsimiles and uh, the ANA attribute basically let us uh, uh, annotate the actuals on, on actual level. So we can say, uh, this we had this open R uh, before, uh, so we can say this uh, R here is an open R, and then we can use this information to search for all open R's, for example. Um, but what we can also do, like with the encoding of the linguistic features, we uh, um, and highlight them in the text, we can encode uh, paleographic features and highlight them in the text. And then ideally, if the text has uh, mainly archaic forms. Uh, linguistically and mainly uh, older archaic forms paleographically, then we can say, well, that must be very likely archaic uh, uh, text. Okay. Um, with this annotation, we can query uh, the fragments on, on basically uh, any level. So linguistic level on, on the actual level. And it's uh, interesting because enriching our, our translation with coordinates allows uh, uh, to search for individual uh, actuals and combinations. And I will hopefully demonstrate this to you in a couple of minutes. Um, and one application of this involves the comparison uh, of, of similar actuals. And with this comparison of similar actuals, we hope to be able to say a bit more about different hands, different writing schools, uh, different stages of the script and so on. Um, and we'll come uh, to that. Um, this is another uh, a chart that I just show you. So this is only for to carry and be. Um, and this shows you the development of the script. So I said before, to carry and be developed like older German, middle high German, new high German, and so did also the script. Uh, uh, and uh, my teacher, Melanie Marzan, was uh, um, very important in, in kind of figuring out uh, this relative uh, chronology. And what we can do now, uh, so this is what we will uh, look at, the 588 uh, fragment. And what we can do now is, uh, here we have all the linguistic things marked up. So that's a different fragment as, as the one we saw before. Here we have all the uh, linguistic things uh, marked up. Uh, and here uh, on the other side, we have all uh, the interesting um, paleographic things marked up. And uh, what's kind of interesting is that one uh, character is, uh, so the um, capital Ma is, stands for Mu because the Tocharians invented their own Aksharas for having not an inherent A, but an inherent uh, Schwa. And we, they're basically written with this capital thing. So basically the Mu here uh, sticks out um, because it is later than, than the average linguistic uh, text here. Um, just, just bear with me. I'm, I'm, I'm showing you application of this right now. Namely, one of my case uh, studies uh, is correlating script and, and language uh, stages. So basically, uh, what you can see here are some of the of the shibboleths uh, that are important. 
And here you see the old older versions of the script. And here you see the classical guises of the uh, of this Shibboleth uh, char character. So again, here's an open, it's a long R, but anyway, that's an R, uh, open top, uh, closed top. Uh, here's a, a, a M, uh, and you can see it has this kind of cross, uh, uh, so diamond shape and a cross, and then the classical M uh, only, uh, well, it's kind of, um, yeah, whatever, uh, hashtag shaped and has one. Uh, bar in it, uh, then uh, we have a ma uh, open uh, in, in the old script, closed in classical, uh, and so on. And uh, let's look at yet another one where we find something very interesting. So uh, here are the phonological features um, of, this, uh, of this manuscript. And uh, so the tendency is um, uh, that it is uh, a classical or kind of early classical uh, a manuscript, um, and I, I skip over this. So basically, here are uh, some of the phonological uh, rules that we pick out with with this search. Uh, and then, if we look, what we would expect would be a classical R, but we don't get a classical R. We get an, an open uh, R uh, here, uh, which is interesting. So basically, it's an uh, a, a classical text with a super super archaic uh, R. That is weird, uh, and and we kind of still kind of try to figure out what happened. Uh, whether this particular scribe was really in love with archaic R's, then it's the question: Why did he know uh, them? Anyway, uh, um, the, the interesting thing that th these are this kind of idiosyncrasies that we are searching for uh, to to basically get down to writing schools and uh, different um, hands. So, and if we do this, so this is on the text level. But if we basically do this um, on, uh, on the level of all texts, so basically compare the different language stages uh, down there with the different uh, script stages up here, uh, we find basically that there is not an exact match. Uh, um, and that, that is interesting. Um, and so a little conclusion that I can bring here is that the relationship between paleographic and linguistic classification system uh, cannot be stated in purely chronological terms where, ling where linguistic and paleographic are casually uh, directly correlate. We really have to consider additional criteria um, and these are Shores and scribal uh, uh, schools um, uh, and, and some other things, <laughs> linguistic linguistic uh, things, because it seems that uh, also the, the things that I showed you kind of purely chronological with the sound changes kind of progressing uh, over time uh, is also not quite the last picture. Um, so similar to if, if we look at, at German dialects today or English dialects, some are more archaic and preserved. Uh, features that are well not Middle English but kind of early modern English uh, and and some German varieties spoken today are basically Middle High German uh, like the the Sette Comune in 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 Italy uh, uh, for example but I'm I'm just saying the the thing is it seems that in with with Tokarian D we have a similar picture so we have um, archaic and non archaic dialects but kind of everything also changed. <laughs> Um, and, and was written in, in different scripts. So a lot of variables we kind of have to get uh, together, but now we can uh, because we have this uh, database. Um, another thing that, that's interesting, uh, because I said basically the, the, um, the tradition started with uh, Sanskrit being imported and then people started to copy uh, Sanskrit on local uh, paper and then in the same kind of generation they started to write to carry them down. Uh, then it's interesting to look at uh, kind of the main uh, centers. Um, so, so here in blue, uh, you have to carry in B, in uh, uh, orange, you have to carry in A, and in gray, uh, you have Sanskrit. And we immediately see two, uh, two three centers that's the uh, Kizil uh, uh, era, uh, area uh, around. Uh, the middle of the northern uh, route and uh, uh, Schwarzschuk uh, a little bit to the east of, of uh, Kizil. Um, if we then look at the different stages, uh, so uh, Kushana and Indian Gupta, 
Uh, so Indian Gupta we already saw, but Kushana is even a stage older uh, and only uh, uh, Sanskrit. Uh, and if we look, kind of, we, we get the same picture. And so uh, Kizil uh, is kind of uh, super important and we have all these scripts attested, uh, which means they were copied uh, and, and transmitted over a long period of time. Uh, and also uh, Schwarzschuk um, again. Um, and if we look at the oldest stages of the script only for uh, uh, Tocharian, uh, we also uh, see Kiesel kind of uh, as, as the main uh, center. Um, and uh, this suggests, well, the tradition, as I said, started around the, the third, uh, fourth uh, century. Um, and um, the oldest uh, extant fragments in, in Tarim Brahmi written uh, uh, on paper are from the fourth uh, century and to Karen started at the same time. And the centers of early manuscripts uh, production seem to have been uh, Kisil uh, and Shortchuk. And it seems that the manuscript culture spread from these centers uh, in the north uh, uh, further on. How it is connected to the south is has become a new question. So we don't know whether the southern uh, variety were um, Sanskrit manuscripts, but Kotanese also is written in whether these come from the northern Silk Road in the Tarim Basin or maybe from somewhere else in, in kind of the Indosphere in Central Asia. Uh, so Gandhara or Mathura um, uh, region. This is a new question and we kind of have to now uh, think about it, how we might be able to uh, investigate this with our uh, database. Um, okay, now I would like uh, just briefly to show you the research app uh, to see what's what's already possible. Uh, let me just um, open this here. So I think the people in the World Wide Web should still be able to see that. If not, holler. Um, so um, uh, we, we were talking about um, this manuscript, uh, the 189 with the funny R's. Um, and so we're still kind of working on the on the layout here, uh, but please bear bear with me for a moment. I can just make it a bit bigger. Yes, that should work. Um, uh, that doesn't work if you want to compare it. But basically, um, what you can do now uh, with our app is uh, it also it's also useful to learn um, uh, Brahmi actually. So you can uh, yeah, I have to make it smaller. I'm sorry, uh, you can go over. Um, these aksharas and it will be highlighted directly on the text and let's look at our funny r's here's a funny r and if i uh, basically hold down the button all the funny r's uh, can be seen in this manuscript i, I do it a little bit bigger uh, because here's another r that's the other side uh, but we can still do it so uh, and they are highlighted and it's also very useful since I said everything is very fragmentary. You can then highlight certain things and see whether they kind of match in a gap that we have uh, and things like that. So that's the one, the one um, thing that I want to show you. The other one, I have to go out a bit here. Um, as I said, we can basically now search for actors. Let's do a car uh, here. So we get all the cars and then we can uh, do different things. Um, so, for example, I only want to see the cars from uh, a specific genre. Let's say in in Profito. Oh, we don't have one. We don't have them. Um, so, where am I here? So sorry. Let's go out again. Uh, yes, we have. We don't have the graffiti uh, in yet. Let's say all the cars in caviar uh, style. So uh, uh, poetry, uh, Sanskrit poetic style then we can get all the cars here. Uh, that's maybe not that interesting, but let's say we want to see all the cars from a specific find spot, uh, Kizil. Um, then we get all the cars here. And then we can say, uh, we only want to see cars in prose. And then we get only cars in prose, or we only want to have uh, specifically old archaic cars. Then we get uh, them here. Okay, cars from Kizil, and then, I mean, as you can imagine, we can of course mix mix everything around, um, however we want. And another thing that I wanted to show you, which is actually really important for this kind of work, because if you look, um, if you compare, let's say, the first row of cars and the second one, would you say those are different hands? Hard, hard to say, right? 
but um, if you if you look at one actual one character alone, but what we can do is we can uh, look for whole words, and then things make it they're a little bit easier than uh, to judge, right? So let's take or oh, man, that's the word for a living being in Tocharian B, and then um, we can basically uh, look at whole words, or I mean, if we like whole sentences and and compare them. So uh, that's that's kind of a nice nice thing. Okay. So we're almost here, uh, here in what my uh, friend and colleague Bernhard Koller never fails to point out, non-idiomatic to carry in the, uh, thank you very much. Yes, Palsko Kritanje Neso. And um, here, uh, here's my, my team. So Bernhard uh, Koller, Martin Braun, uh, and uh, uh, Angelo Mascaroni, Adrian Musitz, uh, Paige Anderson, I should mention, all of them uh, and all of them. Alexander Herrn, Veronika Milanova, Semich Toro, Nora Denke, Gabriel Pantinger, Clara Bramhas, and Benedikt Baumgartner, uh, without whom I would not uh, be here. Uh, these are the institutions we collaborate with, and uh, these are some references if you have time and take a screenshot. Uh, but thank you very much. 